And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Hello and welcome. This is Calvin's Common Sense Crusade with me, the Reverend Calvin Robinson, on your TV, online and on your wireless. Today we'll be discussing the potential scrapping of the Northern Irish Protocol and whether you think it's a betrayal of Brexit. I'll be exploring what led to Nicola Sturgeon's resignation and I'll be joined by the priest who was acquitted after being arrested for silent prayer outside an abortion centre. And of course, we'll bring you the very latest on the Nicola Bully investigation. But first, it's the news with Aaron Armstrong. Good afternoon, it's three o'clock. I am Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom and we do start with some breaking news from the last half an hour. Lancashire police say a body has been found in the River Wire. They've been searching for Nicola Bully, who disappeared from the area more than three weeks ago. Police say they can't yet confirm if the body is that of the missing mother of two and they're working on formally identifying the body. They're currently treating the death as unexplained and say her family has been informed about the latest development. More on that story uh, as soon as we get it here at GB News. Now, a cabinet minister says Boris Johnson's intervention on the Northern Ireland Protocol is not unhelpful because there is still plenty of work to be done. Mr Johnson's warning that scrapping the bill would be a great mistake comes a day after Rishi Sunak and the European Commission president said they'd made very good progress on fixing problems with the post-Brexit trading arrangements. The protocol bill, introduced under Mr Johnson, gives the UK the right to ignore EU rules. And the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Morden, believes that gives the government a stronger bargaining position. I think, you know, it's, it's helpful to remind the EU that we have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. It's helpful to remind them uh, what those expectations are. And, but I, I would also just say that, look, we, there are encouraging signs. There, mm. there is, uh, people are saying there's a lot more to do, but progress is being made. However, political commentator Dr John Coulter says Mr Johnson's intervention on Brexit his first since leaving office, could have serious ramifications. Solving the protocol deal uh, in Northern Ireland will guarantee the security of the peace process for, I would say, the next generation. Now, what Boris has done is really thrown a Trojan horse into the political negotiations here. Originally, the protocol was always seen as the European Union punishing the UK for daring to democratically vote to leave the European Union. So we've got to get a solution to the protocol. 
Sir Keir Starmer says under no circumstances will Labour do a deal with the SNP. Addressing a party conference in Edinburgh, he urged Scottish voters to put their faith in Labour in the wake of Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Sir Keir says he can bring the change Scotland needs and the tide is turning on the Tories and the SNP. Over 15 years in power and what do they have to show for it? Honestly, it's always somebody else's fault. And the reason is simple. They're not truly invested in Scotland's success. Anything Scotland achieves within the UK is met with gritted teeth, seen as a roadblock to the one true goal. Whatever happens in the coming months, my message is the same. No deal under any circumstances. Meanwhile, the SNP leadership contest has its first two candidates. The Scottish Health Secretary, Holmes Yusuf, and the former minister, Ash Regan, have announced their decisions to stand. They did it earlier in the Sunday May, and the other potential candidates to replace uh, Nicola Sturgeon include the Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, and Mary McCallan. Nominations will close on Friday, and the winner of the race will be announced at the end of March. The US Secretary of State has warned uh, that China will face serious consequences if it provides lethal military aid to Russia. Anthony Blinken spoke to the country's top diplomat, Wang Yi. Uh, their conversation took place on the sidelines of the Global Security Conference in Munich yesterday. The US believes Beijing is considering sending weapons and ammunition to Russia for the war in Ukraine. China denies that. The musical programme for the King's Coronation has been revealed. An anthem written by composer Andrew Lloyd Webber is one of 12 new pieces to be played during the ceremony. Best known for the musicals Evita and Jesus Christ Superstar, amongst others, he is said to be incredibly honoured to have been asked. Greek Orthodox music will also be on the playlist. That is a personal request by King Charles as a tribute to his late father. This is GB News. More on all of our stories as and when they happen, but now it's back to Calvin. Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Crusade with me, the Reverend Calvin Robinson. Here's what's coming up this afternoon. Is the potential scrapping of the Northern Ireland Protocol a betrayal of Brexit? My political panel will join me to break down the claims that former Prime Minister Boris Johnson could complicate the talks to get a deal on Northern Ireland. According to the Sunday Times, Johnson says Sunak would get a substandard deal unless he progressed with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Will it all go smoothly or are we headed for a constitutional crisis? Then, this week, it finally happened. After eight years in power, Nicola Sturgeon resigned as First Minister. The SNP is already preparing uh, to decide on her successor, but more importantly, decide on what exactly they're going to do about independence or not. I had a sit down with Dr David Starkey on not just the history, but the future of Scottish independence. And later on, a priest who was arrested for silently praying outside a Birmingham abortion centre walked free from court after criminal charges were dropped. Father Sean Gough held up a sign saying praying for free speech outside and had a sticker on his car which read unborn lives matter. He will join me later on in the show. And of course you can join in any of our discussions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or by tweeting at gbnews. Deus Vault. But before that, the police searching for missing mother of two, Nicola Bolly, say they have discovered a body in the River Wire, near to where she went missing. GB News reporter Catherine Forster joins me in the studio now. Uh, what more can you tell us, Catherine? Very sad news this afternoon from Lancashire Police. So they put out a statement in the last half hour saying that a body has been found. Of course, Nicola Bully disappeared three and a half weeks ago, um, seemingly vanished without trace having dropped her two girls at school, taken the dog for a walk. And it has been a huge mystery. There's been an enormous search going on. But in the last half hour, a statement by Lancashire Police, they say, 
This morning, Sunday 19th of February, you may be aware of police activity around the river near to St Michael's. We want to provide you with an update on that activity. We were called today at 11.36am to reports of a body in the river wire close to Rawcliffe Road. An underwater search team and specialist officers have subsequently attended the scene, entered the water and have sadly recovered a body. No formal identification has yet been carried out, so we are unable to say whether this is Nicola Bully at this time. Procedures to identify the body are ongoing. We are currently treating the death as unexplained. Nicola's family have been informed of developments and our thoughts are with them at this most difficult of times. We ask that their privacy is respected. So important to say, the body has not been identified, but clearly the body has been found close to where Nicola went missing. And of course, the family, the police have all along said they suspected that she had fallen into the river. But the family had been clinging to the idea that she might have gone elsewhere and that she might in fact be alive and have been appealing for her return. So this is obviously incredibly upsetting news and no doubt we will have more developments later today. OK, Catherine Forster, thank you very much. We will keep you updated on that. Now, Boris Johnson has warned Rishi Sunak that ditching the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill in favour of a new Brexit deal would cause a great mistake. The deal being proposed would apparently make the ECJ the ultimate arbiter of disputes about EU law that emerge from Northern Ireland. While some see this as the only way to break the deadlock, some are saying that if we still have a foreign government governing part of our country, we still have a foreign court with jurisdiction, then an awful lot of us would find it very, very hard to find to support it. So is this the smartest and most logical way forward, or is Rishi betraying the union or indeed Brexit itself? Joining me now is policy researcher Laurie Laban and broadcaster Darren Grimes. Uh, good afternoon to you both. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday. Uh, Darren, I'll start with you, if you don't mind. Do you agree with Boris Johnson that scrapping the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill would be a great mistake? Yes, I mean, the BBC's Brussels correspondent earlier tweeted that she understands that the EU won't move ahead with Rishi Sunak's proposed reforms unless, unless there is a commitment to actually drop the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. If you ask me, Calvin, this shows that the EU don't actually give a damn about Northern Ireland or about the Belfast Agreement. It's always been about damaging the interests of the United Kingdom to make Brexit look unappealing to the remaining EU 27 by effectively subjugating unionist communities in Northern Ireland. I actually think Boris Johnson's intervention is a helpful one because it reminds the EU and the government that the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is there for a reason. It was designed for a reason and the reason is really quite simple. It gives our country an alternative because if we don't, all we can do is accept the EU's thin gruel. The EU would have us over a barrel keeping us aligned to it and a constituent part of our country under the jurisdiction of a foreign power. And I don't know about you, Calvin, but that isn't what I had in mind when I voted for Brexit. It's not at all. I'm, I'm liking the footage we're showing there of Boris Johnson and, and Carrie uh, as if they're entering number 10 again. Uh, Laurie, is this about restoring trust? I think it's about Boris Johnson's career ambitions, actually. Uh, I think that him weighing in at this time is there to sort of drive a bit of a wedge that gets a number of people in his own party thinking that he's a kind of guy that they want to go for as leader again. So if, we, if we're questioning the EU's motivations, I also think we should be questioning Boris Johnson's motivations as well. Oh, always. But... The problem here is the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, isn't it? It's important because it's our biggest bargaining chip with the EU. Well, is it our biggest bargaining chip? I mean, there, there are very complex layers of negotiations here, of which there will be a give and take when it comes to certain things. You know, I, from what I've been reading, the EU has 
be more relaxed on some of the customs checks that might be happening because, for example, of a commitment to have more real-time data provided by the UK side. So there's a lot of to and fro that will be going on around the negotiating table. The idea that there's this kind of big you know, nuclear button to press and that that will have some kind of sway over the EU, it's a bit debatable when you look back at the track record of some of the negotiations that we saw over the last few years that maybe didn't work out so well for the country. And Darren, I think Laurie makes some interesting points about Boris. I mean, he might be right, but should we trust him? What are his motivations? Darren Grimes. For a second that Boris Johnson is ultimately interested in Boris Johnson. But when you've got the likes of Ursula von der Leyen saying, well, actually, unless Rishi Sunak scraps this uh, protocol bill, we're not going to go forward and give Rishi Sunak a few tweaks here and a few declarations there. Ultimately, Calvin, the problem here is that there shouldn't be any difference in the paperwork required between moving goods from Darlington to Dagenham than there is actually in sending goods from, say, Bristol to Belfast. There shouldn't be any difference there whatsoever. And I think I, I listened to the remarks there and I, you know, there is something to be said about Northern Ireland being a, a product of negotiation. I don't doubt that for a second. But with the the current set of circumstance, with the Northern Ireland protocol as it as it is right now, the only community that are getting what they want is the nationalist community, the unionist community, not a single unionist member of parliament or the member of the, the assembly, Stormont, supports the Northern Ireland Protocol. The nationalists want an open border, while the unionists don't want a border down the Irish Sea. That's all that they've asked for, Calvin. It isn't the Democratic Unionist Party that's asking for this. It is, as I say, not a single elected representative of any unionist party in Northern Ireland. Does that not tell you everything that you need to know? And that is the point, though, isn't it, Laurie, that we can't, surely we cannot have a border within our country. And our country is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. How can anyone be suggesting that that's a reasonable option? Yeah, of course, I sympathise with that view. I, I, you know, I want the UK to be uh, the full entity that it is and should be. But huge complexities were opened up when Brexit happened. And it requires a lot of complex negotiation, uh, which will end up with compromises to try and make that work, which I'm sure what we all want to make sure happens. And if we, you know, we've just been seeing more pictures of Boris Johnson up there. One of the problems that we experienced when Boris Johnson was prime minister is that he seemed to have this huge disregard for those complexities, for those complexities. And it meant that, yeah, we, we're not talking about compromise that completely undercuts UK interests, not at all, but his desire not to go anywhere near that. And in fact, to at times say that he was going to do one thing and then another thing happened. Just, just it, it's, it's a level of unseriousness that doesn't work to handle what are hugely complex situations. But, but Darren, looking at the bigger picture here, it's not in the EU's best interest to make this work, is it? Because essentially, the problem we're facing is because Great Britain is an island, right? But if a country within the continental Europe decides to leave the EU, let's think Italian Brexit or it takes it or whatever you want to call it, or, or the French or the Greek, whoever wants to leave, well, they'll have the exact same problem, won't they? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, the EU is a very good and tough, robust negotiator. Calvin, from the bottom of my heart, I wish the United Kingdom would be equally as robust in defending our own interests as the EU does theirs. They are utterly ruthless. But when you've got the High Court in Belfast concluding that the, the protocol doesn't put the people of Northern Ireland on an equal footing, that's their words, not mine, with those in the rest of the UK, that directly impacts and intervenes with the Act of Union. And if Rishi Sunak really is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and let's not forget the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party, then he cannot support measures that directly impact and intervene with the Act of Union. It's in the EU's interest to keep us unable 
to diverge from the EU's rules and regulations. That's what they want. They are using Northern Ireland as a pawn in their game to keep the United Kingdom from being competitive from the rest of the EU 27. I think you, it, it, you don't have to be, you know, Lord Alan Sugar to be able to call out that, that kind of negotiation, Calvin. It's pretty obvious to most people what's going on here. Any new arrangement should ensure that there are absolutely no regulatory barriers between Northern Ireland and its biggest market, which isn't the EU, Calvin, but the rest of the United Kingdom. That's what's really important because you can it ultimately have the Belfast Agreement if you have the protocol. Politicians have got to decide which one they want. If they want peace on the island of Ireland, then the protocol has got to go. I mean, Darren makes some fantastic points, Laurie, and just to circle back around to, to complete this conversation, regardless of where you sit on Brexit, the deal that Rishi Sunak is supposedly about to strike with the EU would see the ECJ become the ultimate arbiter of disputes between Britain and the rest and, and the EU on Northern Ireland. Don't you think that that would be a betrayal of Brexit? I think it depends what sort of layers of arbitration, the levels of arbitration you have. To say that they're the ultimate arbitrator doesn't necessarily mean that you get to that point in the context of what these international disputes will be, right? You can have layers of, uh, I don't know how they necessarily do this with different courts, but layers before it ultimately goes to that point. So we may be in a situation where if there's better favour between nations and regions that you do end up not ultimately getting to that kind of point. But again, these these are the, even if you do get to that point, these are the huge complexities from the erupted from the Brexit moment and the fact that there is a land border between an EU and now in this case a non-EU state. And they're so difficult to try and sort out. And I get the idea that, you know, you behave in a certain way to try and influence your opponent, and that's happening from both sides or the person you're negotiating with, sorry. But at the end of the day, it's yeah. going to have to come down to some pretty complex, pretty technical compromises yeah. that hopefully make this work okay. for everyone. Well, thank you very much. Liking the new background, by the way, Darren. That was policy researcher Laurie Leyburn and broadcaster Darren Grahams. Thank you both for your time today. Plenty more to come this afternoon on my Common Sense Crusade. Coming up, after eight years in power, Nicola Sturgeon resigned as First Minister. The SNP is already preparing to decide on her successor, but more importantly, decide what exactly they're going to do about independence. I had a sit-down chat with Dr David Starkey on not just the history, but the future of Scottish independence. But first, here's a short break. See you soon. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the Common Sense Crusade with me, Calvin Robinson, on your TV, online and on your wireless. This week's political shockwaves from Boot House in Edinburgh are still reverberating across the United Kingdom. After eight years in power, Nicola Sturgeon has resigned as First Minister and the SNP is already preparing to decide on her successor and, importantly, to decide what exactly they are going to do about independence. With the latest polling of Scottish voters in the past week putting Labour just behind the SNP in general election voting intentions, you could argue support for independence is waning. I sat down with Dr David Starkey to get his thoughts on Nicola Sturgeon's downfall. David, commentators are saying that her decision to go for broke on woke has been Nicola Sturgeon's downfall. Why do you think she doubled down on the trans issue? Everybody sort of says, isn't it odd, isn't it strange? What on earth does she think she's doing? I've got a very different take on this, Calvin. I think going for broke on woke is absolutely fundamental to Sturgeon and to the particular kind of nationalism that she embraced. See, what is generally the case? I mean, come on, you know, you and I are used to sort of putting things in, in big pictures at various ends of the political spectrum. Where does nationalism normally belong? It belongs very firmly at the right of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. But Scottish nationalism has decided to play a different game. It talks about civic nationalism. It's determined to distinguish itself from anything beastly and old fashioned and sweaty, rather like English nationalism. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you embrace the left. And the further the left goes, the more you've actually got to embrace it. And this, of course, is in one sense really quite clever. You, as it were, you take from nationalism a taint which with today's politics is seen as dangerous, you know, shoving it out on the far right as the kind of thing that we, well, most people disapprove of. But on the other hand, it means because the left boundary goes further and further and further and further, you have to go further and further and further. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And so we've, what we've done, we've seen uh, woke as mere and, and the, the, of course, the preposterous embrace of, of transsexualism or what I would like to call it, transsexualism. We've, we've seen this as something accidental. It's not, it's fundamental, it's central to the enterprise. It's going to be very interesting to see, actually, not, I mean, Sturgeon's got out of it by simply disappearing. Clearly, what happened, Calvin, she found the contradictions absolutely impossible. 
Mm. The question is whether the movement can escape from the position that it finds itself in, because it's not just her. Um, uh, um, Salmon was playing exactly the same game. So they've used it as a differentiating factor, which makes sense, but her popularity has been on the decline for years now. Do you think that's uh, linked to that? And also, do you think she jumped before she was pushed? I think that the, I mean, the decline in one sense is, is simply you know, the, the standard remark, isn't it? All political careers end in failure, even that of goddesses like Nicola Sturgeon. Oh. Uh, but, uh, she's been around a very long time. Um, she, of course, embraced not simply woke on the one hand, but we will get a referendum now, and she failed to do that. Um, and the great problem has been, of course, that the pursuit of this will-o'-the-wisp of, on the one hand, a civic nationalism, and the other will-o'-the-wisp of an immediate referendum on independence has meant the other side is you neglect the boring, dreary business of government. And I think there's another reason why, because of course, this attempt at squeezing the very diverse phenomenon of Scottish nationalism into this strange corner of woke nationalism means that you can't actually agree on anything. If you if you look now at the, her range of successors, you know, from a radical feminist like Cherry to a fundamentalist Christian, you can, you you have the sense of a fundamentally incoherent movement. Mm. And that is the point, isn't it? I wouldn't go as far as you as calling her a goddess. I'd probably refute that. However, she ha has been the longest serving witch. first minister. Well, another word would be witch. Right. Yeah. Well, stay, steady on, David. <laughs> I don't think I agree on either term. However, she is the longest serving First Minister and she is an election winner, but she's been very poor on domestic issues. What do you think her legacy will be? Uh, well, I think the legacy is failure. And I think my guess is, clearly, historian profit is a terribly dangerous role. But what she's done has left the movement in a fundamental and serious uh, dislocated form. The future for it is not at all clear. And I think there's something else. It's not simply that by pretending Scottish nationalism is peculiarly left wing. What you have to do to do that, you actually have to trash the entire history of Scotland. Scottish nationalism, on the one hand, like most nationalism, pretends to be the fulfilment the natural destiny of the history of Scotland. But the only way it can do that is by denying the most seriously and extraordinarily successful period of Scottish history, which is union with England. Mm -hmm. If you compare medieval and early modern Scotland, extraordinarily poor, and more than poor, impoverished, violent, and marginal society in Europe, transforming itself extraordinarily in a very, very few years from Union uh, in the early 18th century into one of the centers of European enlightenment, of industry, of trade, all of it, of course, through the unmentionable, the participation in the British Empire. So by pretending that Scottish nationalism, Scottish identity is naturally to the left, you, of course, ignore the central, the, the central fabric of your history. You also, of course, because you're again going for the left, you're playing the game of being a victim. The one thing that Scots were never is victims. Scotland was never colonized by England. So you create this brave heart myth, which is the absolute antithesis of the greatness and the glory of Scotland, which was part of union. And even you know, the, the, the most striking thing of all, when you go up to Scotland and you look at these great monuments of industry, the great universities, the scientific achievements, these are the triumphs of what? They're the triumphs of the British Empire. The Scots were the fundamental, arguably the Scots were more important in t as, a, as imperial administrators, as industrialists, as, as engineers, as doctors than the English. The British Empire was at least as much Scottish as English. David Starkey, thank you so much for your contribution today. Really appreciate it. A pleasure. On her resignation, Sturgeon said she believed part of Quote, serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right to step down, adding, in my head and in my heart, I know that time is now. That is right for me and my party and for the country. You are with GB News on TV, radio and online. And coming up, a priest who was arrested for silently praying outside a Birmingham abortion clinic walked free from court after criminal charges were dropped. 
while the Schwangoch held up a sign saying praying for free speech outside and had a sticker in his car which said unborn lives matter. He will join me after the break. Now it's time for a check on those news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. It's 3.32, I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. Uh, Lancashire police say a body has been found in the River Wire. They have been searching for Nicola Bully, who disappeared from the area more than three weeks ago. Police say they can't yet confirm if the body is that of the missing mother of two, and they're working on formal identification. They're currently treating the death as unexplained and say her family's been informed of the latest development. A cabinet minister says Boris Johnson's intervention on the Northern Ireland protocol is not unhelpful. Mr Johnson's warning the, that scrapping the bill would be a great mistake comes a day after Rishi Sunak and the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said they'd made very good progress on fixing problems with the post-Brexit trading arrangements. The protocol bill, introduced under Mr Johnson, gives the UK the right to ignore EU rules and leader of the House of Commons Penny Morden believes that gives the government a stronger bargaining position. I think, you know, it's it's helpful to remind the EU that we have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. It's helpful to remind them uh, what those expectations are. And but I, I would also just say that look, we there are encouraging signs. There mm. there is uh, people are saying there's a lot more to do, but progress is being made. Sir Keir Starmer says under no circumstances will Labour do a deal with the SNP. Addressing a party conference in Edinburgh, he urged Scottish voters to put their faith in Labour in the wake of Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Sir Keir says uh, Labour can bring the change Scotland needs and the tide's turning on the Tories and the SNP. Meanwhile, Scottish Health Secretary Humza Yusuf and former Minister Ash Regan have announced they're in the race to replace Nicola Sturgeon as the leader of the SNP. Revealing their plans in the Sunday Mail, they're the first to declare their candidacy for the contest. Environment Minister uh, Mary McCallan has uh, now said she's not standing, but Finance Secretary Kate Forbes is still thought to be a possible contender. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Uh, don't go anywhere though, Calvin is back in just a moment. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Dubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Dubry, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock.
Welcome back to the Common Sense Crusade with me, the Reverend Calvin Robinson, on your TV, online and on your wireless. This week, Catholic priest Father Sean Goch and charity volunteer Isabel Vaughan Spruce were both acquitted of all charges after being arrested for silently praying within an abortion censorship zone. In a video that went viral in December, Vaughan Spruce is seen being arrested by a pair of police officers after admitting she might be praying inside her head outside an abortion clinic in Birmingham. And Father Sean was arrested for silently praying within the same censorship zone whilst holding up a sign that read, Praying for Free Speech. However, the charges were dropped after both cases were judged not to meet the, quote, full code test for prosecutors. And Father Sean Gok joins me now, as well as barrister and legal counsel for ADF UK, Lorcan Price. Uh, Father Sean, first of all, I hope I'm saying your surname right. Is it Gok or Go? Uh, Gok. <laughs> ah, fantastic. Glad to hear it. Uh, whilst this verdict is undoubtedly a huge relief for both of you, actually, and uh, for you and Isabel, how is it that two people have been arrested and taken to court for silently praying in the 21st century Britain? Well, it should go without saying that nobody should be criminalised for the thoughts that they've got in their own mind or for saying prayers on a public street. But sadly, this is exactly what happened to me. Um, I'm relieved to have been uh, had my name cleared, but the reality is that um, th th these uh, situations could continue for other people because these censorship zones, which stop certain viewpoints and even ban prayer, in certain areas are still in place. And whilst I've been cleared, you know, the whole process that I've been through almost was a form of punishment in its own right. Yeah. Uh, and people will ask the question, you know, prayer is not proximate. Why did you choose to go and pray where you prayed? Well, I'm a Catholic and for Catholic priests and for Catholics in general, places have a great significance. You know, we pray in a church, we pray in a shrine. Um, why? Because Jesus became God when he chose to become a human being. He entered time, he entered space. So for me, praying in places of significance is important. And for me, the greatest social justice issue of our time is abortion. Over 10 million babies have lost their lives and been lawfully killed since abortion was legalized in this country. And that's a great tragedy. And so praying at the, or near to the abortion center is a place of great significance uh, for me to pray there. And it's something that's really personally important to me as well. Well, I, it will come as no surprise to you that I, I tend to agree with you, but I'll, I'll talk to Lorcan while you, you fix your connection there, Father Sean. Lorcan, many people will put forward the suggestion that uh, the councils say that these PSPOs are in place to prevent women from, women from being harassed in and around these abortion centres. What do you say to that? Well, harassment is already against the law in, in this country and um, nobody is advocating for harassment or obstruction. Mm -hmm. What these PSPOs do is far broader though and they give local authorities the power to prohibit certain activities that are otherwise lawful, such as uh, consensual conversations between adults in a public place, yep. as Father Sean said, praying, praying silently, praying in your head. Yep. Prov providing information and so on. And um, they are quite large. I think a lot of people listening may think that we're talking about directly outside the door of uh, an abortion clinic. But for example, the, the censorship zone in Birmingham extends for over 200 yards uh, around the street and, and down the public thoroughfare. Mm. So that's larger than a, a stadium. Um, and within that zone then, you have an extraordinarily broad range of things that are prohibited um, in, in a quite a, an outrageous way, really, when, it, when you think of the right to freedom of assembly, freedom of speech and freedom of religion as well. Well, I mean, great answer, but I think you're already conceding too much ground in answering my question because you're admitting that prayer could be harassment. Prayer is not harassment, is it? Oh, I'm certainly not admitting that. <laughs> I'm saying that if there is harassment, yeah. it can be pro it is prohibited already under the law. Yeah. What the PSBO does, it goes far further and it creates a censorship zone essentially around an abortion clinic that is entirely unnecessary considering the way the law already stands and is really quite uh, obtrusive and oppressive of people like Father Sean and, and Isabel mm. who engage in perfectly reasonable and perfectly uh, otherwise lawful activities. And what I understand is that Father Sean wasn't actually praying about abortion at the time. He was praying about free speech, right? Exactly, yes. So, I mean, it gets you get to layers of absurdity with these censorship zones where actually challenging, praying about 
free speech within the censorship zone is is, is criminalized by the censorship zone. So we're, we're, we're seeing some things that you see in, in places like Hong Kong and Moscow where the authorities right. arrest people for holding blank pieces of paper, which is conceivably a crime as well within the censorship zone. So why were the charges dropped? Well, in this case, the Crown Prosecution Service said they didn't have sufficient evidence, um, but they kept open the option to bring the charges again. Mm. So in, in the letter they sent to Father Sean and Isabel, they allowed themselves, um, this is the Crown Prosecution Service, the right to bring the proceedings again. But Father Sean and Isabel both have a right under the law to have their day in court, to have the matter brought before a magistrate, to put the Crown Prosecution Service on the in their spot for in this case, and to say whether or not they have evidence. And here uh, they didn't. Uh, they decided not to pursue the case, and the judge quite rightly returned uh, a not guilty verdict for both of them. Right. Thank you very much. We can't get Father Sean back, unfortunately, so we'll end the segment there. But thank you, Lorcan, so much for your thank you, Richard Gavin. And also uh, thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Price, your parents, for watching. <laughs> Very Give them a bit of a shout out there. <laughs> um, it's interesting that whenever we talk about this, we have technical glitches and all this kind of stuff. So please do pray for uh, there is a spiritual war going on here. And it's important that your prayers are uh, sent out there. So thank you for Father Sean and Isabel Vaughan Spruce. And that was the Catholic priest, Father Sean Goch and barrister and legal counsel for ADF UK, Lorcan Price. Uh, to react to all that is author and broadcaster, my work wife, trouble herself, Rebecca Reed. Hello, Rebecca. Hi, Calvin. How are you? <laughs> First of all, what are your general thoughts on everything you just heard? I think that the people in this conversation have not been in a situation where they've been to an abortion clinic, either for an abortion or for any other kind of health care that's provided in the, in the same building. And therefore, I'm not sure they're fully aware of how vulnerable you are in that moment and how intimidating all of these things can be. Um, and I've seen a real variety of behaviour outside of clinics from relatively calmly praying, holding a rosary, to actual aggression. And I think it's a much cleaner, simpler, a much cleaner, simpler answer to say, just don't do it. As you said, prayer is not proximate. You can pray at home or anywhere else. But even if you think that protesting should not be allowed around abortion clinics, which I would disagree with, even if you think that, surely you don't think prayer is protesting. I don't think you're. I don't think you're intellectually dishonest enough to, to pretend that you actually believe that people are standing directly facing an abortion clinic, demonstrably praying, and that is in no way an attempt to demonstrate to anybody entering the clinic that they are praying. But you've just heard that these this, these geographical areas are massive, so it's not just standing opposite the clinic. You could be standing miles away from the clinic, and you're still within that that censorship zone. So it's not a case of harassment, surely. <laughs> Is, have they been and also again whether it's 50 feet or like why why on earth wouldn't you be able to pray from anywhere else what is the purpose of doing it directly in front of or, or within the exclusion zone if not to protest it and i mean and isabel's not here today but i know if she was here she would say that it's not just about prayer it's about the fact that you should be able to be there not just to protest to provide counsel, advice, literature that might help these women make a better decision, a different decision. On abortion day, the last thing you need is somebody who is not in that position, who does not understand your decision, trying to give you a bloody leaflet. And on, and also the misinformation in the pamphlets given out is extraordinary. The best thing that these people could be doing would be going and running a crash for free accessible childcare. That might actually help somebody be able to make a different decision. But also a lot of the time, it's not even that you need to make a different decision that you don't want to be pregnant and you don't have to be pregnant. And if this isn't your religion, why on earth would you need to be bound by it? Well, it's a life and death issue, so it's much deeper than that. But I do have to apologise for Rebecca's uh, spicy language. We're not on Dunwarton tonight, is it? We're, not, we're pre watershed. But thank you, Rebecca. That's author and broadcaster Rebecca Reed. Let's return to the top story this hour. The police searching for missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, have discovered a body in the River Wire, near to where she went missing. The 45-year-old vanished in St Michael's on the wire while walking her dog three weeks ago. She just dropped her daughters aged six and nine at school. In a statement, Lancashire Police said, this morning, Sunday, 19th of February, you may be aware of police activity around the river near to St. Michael's. We want to provide you with an update on that activity. We were called today at 11.36 a.m. to reports of a body in the river wire close to Rawcliffe Road. An underwater search team and specialist officers have subsequently attended the scene, entered the water and have sadly recovered a body. Joining me now is Peter Blexley, former Metropolitan Police Detective. Uh, Peter, what's your reaction to today's developments? Hello, Peter. What are your reactions to these developments? 
Do we? It looks like Peter can't hear me at the moment. Sorry about that, Peter. We'll get back to you later if we can. Let's have a look at what you guys have been saying to us. Uh, let's have a look at some emails you've been sending in. On the Northern Ireland Protocol, Alan says, it's an utter disgrace and completely unacceptable that any UK government would allow part of its territory to be effectively annexed by a foreign power. The protocol as it exists must be scrapped. Thank you very much for Alan being very sound there in the emails. John says, either Northern Ireland is governed as part of the UK or it's not. England, Scotland and Wales are not under the ECJ in any way and neither can Northern Ireland be. The ECJ can have no role in any part of the UK. It's simple. It seems that everyone's agreeing here. It seems that the politicians need to listen to the British public on this. We cannot separate Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. We are one country, one union. Rob says, all these complexities began when the EU and the Remainers decided we should have further integration. No one voted for that. So none of this is not the fault of Brexit. I like the double negative there, but I think, you know, you're all on to something. I think we are. Thank you for those views, by the way. Thank you for emailing and tweeting. We do appreciate that. I think we've got Peter Blexley back now. So let's return to the top story this hour. The police searching for missing mother of two, Nicola Bolly, have discovered a body, body in the river. Uh, Mr. Blexley, what are your thoughts on the developments we've discovered today? Well, there has yet to be a formal identification of this body, so we cannot say with any certainty that it is the body of Nicola Bully, although, of course, many of the circumstances will lead some people to, to draw that conclusion. I'm obviously going to wait for the formal identification, which is, of course, a very sombre process. It can be done a number of ways, through DNA, dental records, or, if appropriate, a face-to-face -face identification by a loved one. Um, there will, of course, be a post-mortem fairly soon um, and during that process a cause of death will hopefully be established and all this evidence will be gathered together probably for a coroner's court inquest which will take place at some point in the future. All in all a very sombre afternoon. How difficult has this investigation been for Lancashire Police? Well I think they with regards to the investigation um, they came out with a working hypothesis very early on, which was that Nicola Bully had gone into the water. That may yet seem to be borne out, we shall see, with this identification process. With regards to their handling of the, the messaging, the information they put out to the public through press conferences and the like, that fell very way, way short of what I would have expected. Um, it was clumsy, it was clunky at times, it was inaccurate at other times. And, of course, it led to an absolute storm when they revealed that Nicola Bully had alcohol issues connected to the perimenopause. And then we had the Home Secretary and no less than the Prime Minister expressing their concerns and the Information Commissioner weighing in. So all of that at some point in the future will be subject to some very close scrutiny, I'm sure. Well, what will happen next? The body has not yet been identified. If this is Nicola Bully, how hard will it be to establish what happened? That will be a matter for the post-mortem. And, of course, um, pathologists are incredibly highly trained, knowledgeable and learned people. But there will be supporting evidence, perhaps, that might help the pathologists. And in turn, of course, it's really the coroner that will decide the, uh, the cause of death through the coroner's inquest that may be held within a matter of weeks or it may be put off, depending on what further investigations are carried out. Of course, this body will be treated with the respect it deserves, but also any clothing potentially might be subject to forensic examination, perhaps footwear, any other items found. So there's a long way to go on this investigation. And I can thoroughly understand why the police now are probably going to play their cards a little bit closer to their chest in what they reveal, because we need to remember whether this be Nicola Bully or not, there will be people who will be grieving the loss of a loved one. Absolutely. What sort of support will Nicola Bully's family be receiving during this process? 
Well, since the early stages of the investigation, a family liaison officer has been uh, allocated to them. Um, I know many people that have had really a kind of empowering and very satisfying relationships with their family liaison officers. And conversely, of course, some people who have lost loved ones have not got on quite so famously with these specialist officers. People sometimes seem to forget that family liaison officers, that there's a bit of a, a mis sort of conception that they're really there for somebody to pour your heart out to. Actually, and the police might not thank me very much for saying this, but really family liaison officers are there to gather evidence as well. Um, and that's that's the harsh reality of it. They need to be very observant. And of course, they need to be to behave with suitable empathy, sympathy, consideration. Um, and, and I'm sure okay. that uh, in this case, that hopefully is exactly what the uh, the FLO, the family liaison officer, is affording to the bully family, should indeed it turn out to be Nicola, whose, uh, whose body, uh, who, you know, if it's Nicola's body that's been found, sorry. Right. Well, thank you very much for that, Peter Blexley, former Metropolitan Police Detective. Now, Roald Dahl's children's books are being rewritten to remove language deemed offensive by the publisher Puffin. In the new editions of the books, Mrs. Twit is no longer fearfully ugly, the Oompa Lumpers have gone gender neutral, and Augustus Gloop is no longer fat. The publisher said the review of Dahl's language was undertaken to ensure that the books can continue to be enjoyed by all today. The General Secretary of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young, joins me now. Toby, without a review, these books couldn't be enjoyed today? Yeah, um, the notion that they have to be sanitised and somehow turned into bland, anodyne, politically correct text before they can be appreciated by children and parents reading to their children today is completely absurd. It's patronising, it's ridiculous, and um, it's an insult, frankly, to the memory of Roald Dahl. Well, absolutely. And is it just wokeness taking over? I mean, we could argue that these stories have always been changed. If we look at, for example, old fairy tales in Brothers Grimm and then look at the original Disney makes, they have been softened up. So is this not something we always do? Um, I, I, I don't recall something quite like this being done before. Um, I mean, I think that in some cases, um, when Disney adapted Grimm's fairy tales, they made them slightly less horrifying. But that's not quite the same thing as actually going back to the original text and bolderizing the text to take out some of the original language. I mean, the only precedent, uh, or perhaps the oldest precedent I can think of, is um, Samuel Toby, Johnson. Sorry. Because of breaking news, we've had to cut this short. I'm really sorry. That was the General Secretary okay. of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young. Thank you for your time today, Toby. Uh, a spokesperson for the Roald Dahl story company has previously said, when publishing new print runs of books written years ago, it's not unusual to review the language used alongside updating uh, other details, including a book's cover and page layout. Our guiding principle throughout has been to maintain the storylines, characters, and the irreverence and sharp-edged spirit of the original text. Any changes made have been small and carefully considered. You have been watching Calvin's Common Sense Crusade with me. I apologise that there's been no prayer today, but the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost with us all evermore. And happy birthday to my mother. Happy birthday, Mum. See you later. Love you. Nana Rakoya is up next. See you next week. Day is fault. Hello there. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm Jonathan Fortree. We do have a few sunny intervals around this afternoon, but the general theme for the next few days is a cloudy one. Frontal systems pushing their way across the northern half of the UK will bring a more unsettled picture here. Although we have high pressure in the south, the feed of southwesterly winds coming in off the Atlantic is going to slowly build the clouds here. So a few clear intervals for central southeastern areas of England throughout this evening, but the cloud tending to build as we move throughout the night. And some bits of drizzle are possible for Northern Ireland, parts of Western England and Wales. More extensive rain moving into Scotland. This will be accompanied by some particularly strong winds. Up to 60, 70 mile an hour gusts are possible. So do just take care here. Underneath the cloud, though, it's going to be a mild night for all of us. Some places holding up around 10, 11 degrees Celsius. The rain across Scotland will tend to stall into Monday, so it could turn into a, a fairly damp and drizzly day here. For the north of that will be some sunny intervals for the Northern Isles, but it's going to remain particularly gusty across Shetland. For Northern Ireland, England and Wales, it will be a cloudy day. The odd break is possible, perhaps for parts of Herwickshire and Northumberland, so 
temperatures could reach 15, 16 degrees Celsius, but we'll retain that cloud as we move into the evening period. Again, some drizzle is possible. The rain in the north gradually shifting its way off more into parts of the highlands and eventually clearing its way off to the northern isles as well. But the vast majority of us will again remain frost free as we move into the start of Tuesday. Looking to be another fairly cloudy day for all of us. Again, the odd glimmer of sunshine might come through, but for most of us, we will see fairly great skies. Into Wednesday, we'll start to see this frontal system shift its way south eastwards across the country. And that will bring in a slight change to our weather. We start feeding in some northerly winds, and so it will turn brighter for a time, but we'll also see temperatures just falling, drop, falling off that bit more. Enjoy your day. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel.